Yeah, thanks. This is a great question around what are we learning about patients with coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease? And for a long time, we've thought about atherosclerosis, importantly, as a, a burden of atherosclerosis, meaning lipids forming in the vessel wall, inflammation happening, and then thrombosis. So I often think about it actually as atherothrombosis, plaque buildup, inflammatory causes that lead to thrombosis, and then clot that either causes occlusion of the vessel there or downstream. And in coronary artery disease, for some time, we've known that that leads to heart attacks, but we've been better realizing recently that in peripheral artery disease, these thrombotic events may go downstream and actually cause microemboli or occlusions there that cause limb pain or limb loss. Now, the biggest advances in CAD and PAD are several interventions across that spectrum. You know, for a long time, we've been using statins, blood pressure medications, other things, but now there are therapies that inhibit both the atherothrombotic component low dose uh, factor 10 inhibitor with uh, 2.5 milligrams of rivaroxaban now in both Compass and Voyager has been shown to reduce limb events and cardiovascular events in those patients with PAD, CAD. And also a variety of agents now to better manage the lipid component. So in addition to just statins, we have now both I icosapent ethyl for people with high triglycerides. We actually know for sure soon we'll have PCSK9. We already have had PCSK9 inhibitors, but maybe longer acting ones like in glycerin coming onto the market that'll help our patients. Yeah, thanks. I think the, the field of, of, of management of atherosclerosis is certainly really exciting. And there's a several sets of things going on. The, the first is uh, on the market, as I mentioned earlier, I think that there are gonna be new therapies that have been approved or now indicated uh, both for the atherothrombotic component but also longer acting uh, PCSK9-like inhibitors like in glycerin, a, a twice year injection that can get your cholesterol down to well below 70. Additionally, our patients are gonna benefit from studies aimed at different components of this pathway. Um, we've known for some time that lipoprotein A is an important risk factor. We haven't had therapies for that. We now have ongoing studies and other therapies coming for that on the lipid side. Additionally, the thrombotic side uh, in coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, we're gonna have sets of studies aimed at factor 11 inhibition, a new target for antithrombotic therapy. Those are also starting to kick up over the next several years. And finally, I'll just say more patient-engaged research, patients engaged in the research through both digital and in-person research to help us better get to a wide variety of people at risk for these diseases. You know, in the coronary disease and peripheral artery disease space, um, the biggest new sort of indications or opportunities for our patients, I think are gonna be linked to things that just happened in the thrombotic space for expansion of 10A inhibitors, like I said, for limb events with uh, river oxband 2.5 milligrams. New therapies like in glycerin, which may really improve adherence with twice a year injections that can get people's cholesterol down well below 70. And then we anticipate a set of studies to help us better understand how we image and care for our patients. So not just the drug therapies, but uh, continued advances in CT scanning and pressure wire technology will help us better risk stratify our patients with atherosclerotic disease. Finally, even though it's not PAD and CAD, there's been an explosion of therapies that can help our patients with a concomitant kidney disease. And so we know that therapies like um, SGLT2 inhibitors, venerinone, uh, the antifibrotic agents that can help us prevent diabetic kidney disease worsening, or certainly help our patients who have coronary disease, vascular disease, and kidney disease. What's gonna be transformative over the next five years in clinical research? And I actually think the most transformative thing we're gonna do is getting closer to patients. Even though we all take care of patients every day and COVID's been happening and we've all worked through this un unfortunate pandemic, what we realize is if we can engage our patients up front to understand what their preferences are and help them design the questions, we're much better at recruiting people. And I suspect we're gonna be going much more to patient partners and participants rather than the traditional methods because we're democratizing research by going directly to the people who have the conditions and helping them ask us with us the questions that matter. So we look forward to working with patients closer as we think about that. We envision doing that will also help us get a much more diverse set of people into our studies, a diverse set of people who have these conditions so that when we have findings, they'll go to therapy from demonstration of evidence to actual practice much faster.